Hello everyone, the one called Fate knocks at your door. We're finally back with another Dungeons & Dragons recap episode of Tabletop Recap. If my math is correct, this should be the first episode in December. So it's been a long time since the last Descend into Avernus episode, but it hasn't been... Well, it's been a long time for you guys, but not us, because we're recording this in October. Uh, well, the thing that happened was... We had this big accidental hiatus because a lot of people got new jobs and my computer stopped working all at the same time and they moved. Some of the players' computers stopped working too. Yeah. And all this happened like all at once. And we were like, oh no, we can't make episodes right now. And so we ran out. So what we did was we just made a bunch of episodes on a bunch of different games so that we would be like two months ahead and that we, we wouldn't run into any episodes when life ran into us. So the episodes would keep coming out even if we weren't able to make them. So that's why th this is really spaced out. And uh, <laughs> so that's why the, these past two Descendant to Avernus episodes have been real spaced out. But uh, it should be pretty good. We got, uh, let's let's say everybody's characters first. We got a new player as well. Yes, new player and a new player character. Two Two new player characters and a new player. Yeah. Because the Legends character died last time. So, basically, we have the two regulars that we've had since this group got started. Maya Stan Ballastar, G's character, is the only long-surviving one. Yeah, he's the, he's the only one that's made it to level 5 since his creation in level 1. Yeah, he's, he survived everything we've played. Sunless Citadel, Rick and Morty, and so far, Baldur's Gate descends into Avernus. Then you have Connor the Trading Card Goblin, who was an artificer during the Sunless Citadel campaign, but due to an inter interdimensional event, wound up dying and is no longer with us. The final boss of Rick and Morty killed him. Yep. And so now we have Corvus, the half elf warlock to the Raven Queen. Yeah. Better character too, I think. Yeah, definitely more better, more rounded. I think it's built better, and I think he plays it better. So props to him for that. <laughs> he still runs me the wrong way Some, sometimes. Sometimes it's like, dude, just stop, stop, stop it, stop. But still, yeah. So then you have D Legend, who, if you remember from our last session, his character is buried under six hundred pounds of rubble, thanks to Connor. And G. So <laughs> that was just not thought through. Well. That was not thought through. But it's fine. They, so, they played much better today than they did last time. He has a brand new character. Still a monk. But this time it is a much more well-developed monk. Uh, he's a Kensei monk by the name of Jadal Blackline. Apparently there's some Thundercats references there, something that I'm not familiar with. I don't know. I thought it was a Voltron reference at first. That's when he what said it was, it. Voltron. That's what I, I, it wasn't, but that's what it made me think of when he said Black Lion, because that's the main lion in Voltron, if I remember correctly. I haven't watched Voltron since high school, and I haven't seen the new Netflix one, so. So Jadal, the Kensei monk, Tabaxi. Yeah, Tabaxi was cool. But we also have a second Tabaxi. That's not the only one. Yes, we also have Quinevere, who I'm not sure who Quinevere's player wants Keo Cat. To... She wants to go by Keo Cat. Keo Cat, okay. Keo Cat, who is playing Quinevere, the Druid, the Forest Druid Tabaxi. That's what yeah. it was. Circle of Circle of Nature forest druid. So she was like, what kind of species should I be? And I was like, you know, there's a cat person. And she went, <gasps> <laughs> kitties? And then she took like, you know, those quizzes you can take online that tell you like what kind of class and stuff you are. She took, um, she took that quiz and ended up being druid. And I was like, that makes complete sense. That's what I was going to recommend to you anyways. Um, and she honestly, despite being brand new, played the smartest and just statistically and strategically the best out of all of our players so far. She didn't know half the stuff of what she was doing going in, but she played it safe, she played it smart, and she tried her best to work with the party rather than just try and finagle and barter with the DM like some players or, you know, just run in being crazy. She was the, uh, she was definitely the MVP of her first combat ever. Because... Yeah. 
she stopped a TPK. She stopped a TPK, which was dope. <laughs> she um, she might not have had a chance to really role play except for once, but that I mean, it is a dungeon fault. crawl. And, so. and that's I felt so bad with the session for her, be, and not for her, but I felt bad because of the fact that she wasn't getting a lot of role play. I felt that the whole session she would only interact by taking her turns in combat and responding to anything that I asked. Uh, I wish and I hope that I didn't turn her away from this first session. Well, yeah, she was messaging me questions on Facebook the whole time because she didn't want to keep asking them while other people were talking. Because, you know, because once again, she's a brand new player who's having to learn over distance because one, COVID, and two, she lives in a different state. So she's having to learn like over the internet. Well, so she had a ton of questions then we couldn't really point things out to her on her sheet because she wasn't here. So... I was messaging her stuff the whole time. Yeah, we had her her character sheet pulled up on our laptops as well as she was looking at it. And whenever she had a question, we would just point out, okay, do you see this part of the sheet? Or do you see what this says? And we'd walk her through it. Um, yeah, she told me she thought you did a great job, actually. <gasps> I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, she told me that. I'm so happy. I was so worried that I did her dirty. Yeah, it was it was good. I think she really enjoyed it. I think it went on a little long for her. She didn't expect to play for how long did we Four play? Four and a half hours. That's and the longest session this group has had so far, isn't it? I'm exhausted. And I, I was exhausted when I got here today. We will we will explain <laughs> why it was exhausting, not just for the DM, not for the co DM, but for everybody. Okay, yeah, that's our introduction. So let's do an initiative uh Roll. Do not give me the purple D twenty. <laughs> That's the curse die. That is the that is the D twenty that always fails death saving throws. <laughs> it's, it's the one that's nearly killed. No, it has killed D Legend's character twice. Six. Five. Oh uh, well, I'm gonna pass it off to you because I was only paying half attention the whole game. Okay. <laughs> so we started off last game with D Legend's character Carrick being buried in rubble. Well, oh, my there thing... actually is something I want to say first. Go ahead. So, when we added, we have a Facebook group chat, and when we added Keocat, I, I proposed something new. I was like, look, lots of us can't meet every other week. Uh, some of us have multiple jobs. Some of us are in school, etc., etc. So my proposition was, um, as long as we can get three players... We play, and if another, and if the fourth can't be there, then they just won't be there that session. And that was a really smart idea because for the first half of the session, I felt really bad for him. Connor was having some serious PC issues. Yeah, his computer just crashed. Yeah, his computer crashed. Um, he he was, did not have a backup of his character sheet, which he keeps on his computer. He was so able to eventually crashed. get access to his hard drive, so he had his character stat sheet, but he could not access Google Chrome. He could not access certain internet functions, and he had to use his cell phone uh, or smartphone to actually access the Google Meet so that he could actually talk to us without being on the phone. Yeah. We actually did wait on him for about 30 minutes. And then he told us to start because he yeah. didn't want us to and, wait. And we were, we were more than willing to wait. But he was very courteous in saying that, you guys, I need to figure this out. Don't wait on me. I'll join if I can. Yeah, so his character missed the introductions of Keocat and D-Legend's new characters, and he missed the combat with the Necromancer. But the thing was, I was like, we need to do like Adventurers League, where if you just don't show up, your character's just not there. You don't get experience points or whatever. But then when you show up, we didn't, we're not going to spin a story thing to get you back into it. We're just going to drop you into it like you were there the whole time and tell you everything that happened. Yeah. So that just makes it easier on literally everybody. Like, it's because if you had to keep coming up with reasons why they were leaving and coming back, it would be so stupid. Yeah. So we're just going to adventure as League it. Uh, Which totally works, I think, for a group dynamic. Because like you said, not everyone is going to be here 100% of the time. But we do all want to play, and none of us want to hinder each other from playing. So I think Adventures League Rule is going to be the way to go. And the reason we're doing this is because it's a 1-13, to 13, and we need to play about every other week if we want to stay on track with this. We don't want it to be like our other group where we meet once every two months, and then we'll never finish. Yeah, I really want... No offense to the other group. Uh, it's all good. We still love you and love playing with you, but yeah. it, it just takes us forever. Yeah, we, we have to keep things moving along. So yeah, but we did vote on that. I didn't just say that and then it was instituted. We voted on it. It was pretty unanimous. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. 
And uh, now we're going to enter the session. I'm going to let you talk about the story now. So, pretty much, Carrick is dead, D-Legend's old character. Corvus is out of it for right now because his laptop is down. So really, we just have my stand. And he, at the end of the combat from the last session, where they were fighting the Fists of Ball, which were actually the leaders of the Ball cult at that time, was part of the Dead Three. So they'd already knocked out one of the heads. Um, they, he went to go talk to the person they were torturing on the altar, and he told them that, you know, help me, but don't forget to help the other prisoners. And he's like, what other prisoners? And he said, in this altar, there's a hidden passage that leads to a secret holding area. Unbeknownst to Maya Stan, that that is where Jadal and Guinevere are being held. Now, <clears throat> they, uh, he loots some keys off of one of the ball guys, and they unlock the holding cell. There's a very awkward <laughs> role-playing session where they introduce each other's characters and get to know one another. And uh, eventually, um, I just say, while you guys are talking and introducing each other, you hear voices coming from up the stairs. Um, basically, that was just an excuse to get them out of that dungeon area and get the, the play session going. So then the next thing that they did is um, they had two ways that they could go. They had a set of doors off to the side or a door at the opposite end of the room. And the door at the opposite end of the room, as the characters approached, it started smelling like sulfur. I thought it was rotten eggs. Yeah, right. well, rotten eggs is a very sulfury smell. Like my, uh, I don't think I've ever smelled sulfur, man, so... If you've ever been to Statesboro, they use sulfur to clean the water. It smells just like bad eggs. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I've been the states maybe is that why the tap water at the hotel i stay at in statesboro tastes so bad yes that's why they use sulfur to sterilize it and that's it smells like rotten eggs because i have to stay in a hotel there a lot for school and the tap i'll get up at one in the morning put clothes if i'm thirsty put clothes on walk downstairs to the vending machine before i drink the tap water because it's so nasty that's why they put sulfur in the tap water that is gross but that's what the room smelled like on the other side of the store so they opted not to mess with it so they go to the door on the other end and this is where they have a confrontation with the second leader of the dead three the um hand or the uh the skull of mercule and this is a Challenge rating for Necromancer, who nearly killed the team. You know what? Honest, it, this is true. If Keocat did not join for this session, it would have been a TPK. Yes. Um, and so here's what happened. The players did not stealth their way down this hallway. Like, the, the Necromancer knew where they were before... Um, they could sneak up on her. So Which she, is fine, because they have to take her out yeah, anyway. And, and the book specifically says that if no one makes an avid attempt to stealth, and if anyone has any light sources, which my stand did, he yeah. keeps forgetting to turn that damn candle out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so combat started immediately. And this necromancer, there's, there's technically a 2v3 fight. It's the necromancer and a swarm of undead rats that she has already resurrected. And then there's the three players. And so the rats got a nat uh, 20, so they got to go first. And they attacked uh, Jadal, which is D-Legend's character. Um, and even though they can occupy the same space as the character, and they're basically crawling all over him, they don't have enough of attack bonuses to actually deal any kind of damage to Jadal or anyone else. So they're just like nibbling on their, his clothes. And they're... So they're all, for whatever reason, they are more concerned with these undead rats, which are just rats with extra bones, <laughs> that they just completely ignore the necromancer that is standing in the middle of the room, and um, they're just swinging at the horde of rats, like, get off me, you little buggers, get off me. And the necromancer was like, well, since they're not paying attention, fireball. fireball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she is a level three spellcaster wizard. Who knows Fireball as a, as a third level spell? She could have cast it twice and just killed everybody, but then they started closing the gap and she didn't want to blow herself up. Yeah, everyone got hit by that Fireball except Keocat, who just yeah, she, had it on out of there. I say, yeah, everybody make a dexterity saving throw, and uh, she was the only one. Uh, she was the only one. No, no, no. Yeah, she was the only one who made a dexterity saving throw to get out of the way. Um. Jadal and Maestan. Maestan's Dragonborn, so he only took half damage. He took half, yeah. But uh, Jadal was the one who went from 27 
to 7 HP in a single throw. <laughs> he then... took 20 damage! Oh! And then... Th then, uh, the two guys were like, well, I guess we have to attack the Necromancer now, so they ran in there to fight her, leaving uh, Keokant with the Rattos. Uh, and then... <laughs> and then as they fought, the Necromancer... Kills D Legend's brand new character. Well, t technically not killed. He was having to make death safe throw, so he was unconscious, struggling to survive. And she does knock him down with a ray of fire. Like she uses like the three blast fire ray, uh, two on my stand, one on D Legend, and D Legend just happens to go down because of it. Yeah, and on his next turn, he rolls uh, the death saving throw, nat one. So he takes two fails. two immediate fails. And, and then, at that point, we tell him... See, he's been using the same purple D20 dice. Every time he rolls that purple D20, it's awful. I think I lost it. Good. <laughs> good. Absolutely, that's good. No more purple D20. Yeah, I have no idea where it went. It's, I think it's in your hand. Didn't you just pour out? Oh, the, yeah, there it is. Yeah. It's literally... So, yeah, this, this little purple D20 has... It was the thing that killed him last time, and it was the thing that knocked his character out this time. Yeah, it's had him die twice in two sessions, so we were like, dude, stop using the purple D20. So, D-Legend is currently rolling death saving throws. Meanwhile, Maya Stan sees this and he thinks, okay, she's a sorcerer. I bet you if I close the gap, she'll stop using spells and I can just bully her to death. Well, he didn't realize that she had a flail, a silvered skull-shaped flail hidden up underneath her wizard robes. And she smacked the crap out of him for necrotic damage. Like, the flail itself only does, like, 1d6 plus strength damage, which isn't a lot for my stand. But then it deals an additional 12 necrotic, so this, this mace is doing, like, 16 damage per successful yeah. hit. And it was silver, and the obvious reason for that is so that they can get a silver weapon before they go to hell. Right. And they're, they're going to have lots of opportunities to get silver weapons, but that was just the first one they come across. And so <laughs> then there's another death and then saving actually, throw. Actually, no, but I forgot to mention um, when D Legend first went down, my stand did something really clever uh, where he took a, a mace that he had taken from another dead three member, and the necromancer was standing by a pillar. You know, the same kind of pillar that killed Karen. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he right. threw it, he did that. and he actually he actually took a good chunk of health away from the Necromancer. He, he buried her in rubble and did, like, half of her HP. Yeah, I was hoping he would do that. But unfortunately, it was only half, and so she, like, just, just crawls out of the rubble, and she's like, you're going to make some fine corpses. Then he closes the gap, and then she smacks him with his flail. <laughs> Meanwhile, um... Keokat's character, Quinevere, is still she successfully basically defused the rat swarm. She's killed enough rats to where they're no longer a threat. Oh yeah, but she comes in to heal D Legend's character before he dies, but then G's Maya Stan character goes unconscious from yeah. attacks. And then Keokat is like, he's the big hitter, and uh he's a level higher than everybody else, which is a little metagamey, but also completely okay. I did not want That's the good... That's the kind of metagaming I'm completely fine with. I didn't mind that because I did not want to TPK this early in the, in the game. So, she healing... What, what, what is her healing? Uh, she used a uh, healing word. Yeah, healing word. That's it. Um, on my stand to bring him back up, but since she didn't use it on D-Legend's <laughs> character... He rolled another death saving throw, which you gave him advantage on. Yeah, my, my exact words were, because of Quinevere's positive healing energy that she just brings into the room, I will give you advantage on your final saving throw. And he rolled a five and a one. <laughs> and he died again. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, obviously we're all <laughs> laughing and he's getting upset. And then I and this is what I would have said, no. You die. Your body goes cold and the lights leave your eyes. But suddenly, you find yourself in a void. Absolutely no light whatsoever. Completely pitch black. But you hear a sharp, raspy voice come from the darkness. And he says, You have skills that could be valuable to me. Join me and you shall live. And all of a sudden, a giant skeletal hand emerges from the void 
And he says, take my hand, and the deal is struck. And DeAndre straight up thought about just letting his character die. Like, at first, he he said he would. He was like, you know what? I think I think he should just die. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool. If, if he dies, I will hand you my Clarence Spell Shell character sheet, and you can just play that until you want a new character. I was totally okay with that. Clarence Spell Shell, like, RP-wise, is extremely easy to run. I made him that way on purpose. Uh, but then... And he was he was like, what happens if I take the deal? And then all I, I was like, you live. live, but you owe some 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 <laughs> god probably. You just in debt. And he was like, you know what? I'll do it. Let's see where it goes. And here on the podcast, we call that pulling a genie. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's become the name because that's exactly what happened to fate back in. Kami's campaign. Yeah, except Kami had that prepared because he knew fate was going to die. You you just pulled it out your butt because you were like, no, I'm not making another new character. Took me forever to get those two to sit down and make theirs. So <laughs> I'm not doing this again. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But if that character dies again, you know, no, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no third chance. No take backsies. <laughs> so, yeah. So he was resurrected with one HP left and he was stable. Air filled his lungs as he rose from the poo water that everyone was currently fighting in. He got a healing word. Luckily, um, that boss was holding a greater healing potion and two regular healing potions, so that was enough for everybody. And then freaking Connor's character just comes strolling in. Yeah, after all of this happens. <laughs> which Connor's character is supposed to be the one that has a murder boner for trying to deal with necromancers and the undead. This yeah. was the fight that should have that... like made him the most excited, and he missed it. He missed it. Poor guy. I felt so bad for him. He was looking so forward to playing today. I'm very glad he got to play. Me too. But I hate that for him because he just missed the fight that would have made his character incredibly happy. Yeah. But uh, I'll let you continue on from there. So they... Oh, and uh, my stand did take that silver flail. Yes. They got the Necromancer's um, cloak. They got her silver flail, which my stand is keeping. They have her spell book because she is a wizard, not a sorcerer or a warlock. Um, and they also got the healing potions. And so from there, they kind of moved on. The next room that they explored, um, they were looking through it, and I said, this is just a small room full of rubble with a single normal, emphasis on normal, rat. Not a giant rat, not an undead rat like the ones they just fought. Just a regular rat, just like running in little circles. And, for food. And Kia Cat was like, finally I can talk to an animal. <laughs> Because she wanted to talk to the other rats, but they were undead, and then she couldn't. And actually, in the, the book, their stat block is just the same for a regular swarm of rats, but they are immune to necrotic damage, and they cannot be targeted by any druidic animal talk spells. Yeah. So, uh, she spoke to the rat, which she was very happy to do. <laughs> and the rat roleplay, I think, was my favorite part during the whole session, because that's the only part that really made me laugh. <laughs> She's like, hi, little guy, what are you doing? Food, please! Food! I need food, please! <laughs> the rat wouldn't talk to him without food. I think you should have done Mickey Mouse. Oh, <laughs> oh give me some food, please! Oh, that's why you gotta wear the purity ring! Uh -huh. <laughs> Is that supposed to be an anti-Semitic joke? No, it's a South Park joke! Oh. Remember the Jonas Brothers episode? I've only, seen, against a girlfriend? I've only seen the episode where Mickey Mouse goes to China. Oh. You should watch that episode. It's pretty disgusting. Uh, okay. So, anyways, they talk to the rat, and the rat gives them a heads up about some of the stuff that they should expect. Because further into the room, there's a hallway that leads to apparently a cursed area with a trap. And then there's a torture chamber and some magical stuff with magical writing on the wall that they should be aware of, blah, blah, blah. And this was the part where things started to drag on. Because basically, in this room, beyond where the rat is... There is just a sunken and cracked um, tomb, or a, what, like sarcophagus. It was casket, a, sar it was a sarcophagus, and that was it. You remember when you called it a coffin, and then me with my funeral studies degree came in, and I was like, "Actually, uh, it's not a coffin." <laughs> Let me flex real well, quick. Well, I said sarcophagus first, and then just because I was trying to juggle so much crap, I said coffin by accident. So, um, my Stan and Keocat do not want to engage in this. They just want to move on. But D Legend and Connor want to go in, and they're like, "We want to go see the the sarcophagus and look for loot and stuff." 
uh, even though the rat has told him that there's a, a haunted area here and that there's probably a trap. And um, so they go into the room, they try and disturb the sarcophagus, and then all of a sudden a ghostly battle axe appears from the, uh, from the, the sarcophagus. Which the rat warns them about. Yes. And... And you gotta, now, some of the things that the guys were saying afterwards was like, that rat didn't give us a lot of clear information. I'm like, it's a damn it's, rat. It's a rat, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it literally has the memory of a single day. It literally goes through a clean wipe after every 24 hours. You looked at G and you went, his brain's the size of a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, so there's this battle ass, battle, just not even a ghostly apparition a- attached to it. Just the battle axe that's floating there. And D-Legend wants to try and talk to it. He's like, hello there. It tries to attack you. It fails miserably, but it swings at you. And you're like, okay, I want to run away from it. Attack of opportunity. Still miss, but it's coming after you. They were they were so obsessed with this axe. Like, there was one point, they, they couldn't... They just wouldn't leave the axe alone. And so, I was like... Chungus, can I talk to you in another room for a second? So we went to the other side of the house, and we closed the door, and we just went, Ugh! <laughs> and I explained to you what was going on, because you thought it was some kind of like ghostly encounter. I'm like, no, the axe is the trap. There's no ghost. It's literally just a spectral weapon floating in midair. And here's the thing. The weapon is indestructible. No amount of magical or physical attacks will stop this thing. But to counteract that, the axe will no longer attack anyone if they leave this... 10 by 15 size room. Yeah, and the characters wouldn't get the hint, so you put a ghost in there to tell them that they didn't need to be there. Yeah, I literally just said, <laughs> get out! Get out! And Connor was like, I want to try and bargain with the ghost and convince it to, like, stop haunting it. Okay, well, there's a DC of 100. <laughs> well, not even that. I just told, like, the ghost doesn't want to leave. It wants to rest, and you're disturbing its rest. Leave him alone. <laughs> And finally, after that, they decided to move on. Classic. Because that axe group. would have killed them. That axe, if they stayed in that room, would have killed them. Yeah. Uh, so they left that and continued on. They then came to another room uh, later down the line that was a room of the necromancer they just killed. It was a single stone altar covered with numerous candles with green wicks and flames uh, that was illuminating lighting... On a writing on the wall that said rise and be counted and this was the one that I wanted to interact with like they were they you were, told them pretty much what it was yeah because I said my stand this actually looks familiar because this is uh, he rolled a nat 20 on perception so even though he True. didn't roll an arcana roll I gave him a reward by saying these these letters have some magical writing because he had experience of that very type of magic yeah like when they were in the sun the citadel there were several encounters where there was writing on the wall or on a fountain that when spoken out loud either a positive or negative occurrence happened and i said you since you rolled a nat 20 you see everything that's going on in this room and you recognize that these letters are similar to the sun the citadel that if you read them something might happen they did not read them but what would have happened three skeletons would have risen from the ground but here's the thing the skeletons are tied to whoever said the words for the next 24 hours yeah so they would have gotten allies yeah Tempor- and the thing is is that even after the spell wears off they're not inherently dangerous to anyone unless they're attacked directly so even if um yeah i remember you telling me all that last week i'm just asking you for the podcast even if they decided to just destroy the skeletons the skeletons wouldn't even fight back unless the person who said rise and be counted said defend yourselves so they could have gotten ah the help they so desperately needed and the thing is is that they're one they, they have this session the average player just had poor judgment they kept wanting to interact with the things that would kill them looking at the mold and the the ghostly axe, and they completely said, no, I don't want to deal with the stuff that looks like it might kill us, when it was, in fact, things that would reward them positive stuff. Yeah, sometimes you got to take a chance. Remember Clarence Spellshell, you know? He, he, he took too many chances, but, you know, it all worked out for Clarence. Yeah. Even Meepo, the, the dumb kobold dragon keeper, was like, hey, I found you guys some potions of fire breath by reading crazy letters. Yeah, and that helped us kill a dragon in one round. 
A wormling, sure, but... Still a dragon. Still a dragon. <laughs> um, you don't have to say wormling when you tell the battle tale. Yeah. You just have to say dragon. And uh, so, moving on from that room, they just completely bypassed it. They have now come full circle to the room that smells like sulfur and rotten eggs. And I almost... I had to ask my stand, because my stand is the only character that does not have dark vision. Mm -hmm. Connor is a half-elf, and Jadal and Quinevere, D-Legend, and... Keo cats are tabaxi. So everyone except my set has night yeah. vision goggles. I think Connor just had it through his raven. And he didn't actually have it, but his no, half I, I play a half elf in one of our other campaigns, and half elves do have dark vision. Oh they do. Okay. Yes. I haven't played a half elf since high school. So. Yeah, that's one of those elf, <laughs> that's one of the elf traits that they inherit. Okay. So yeah, they um so everyone else can see what's going on, but my stand can't. And he currently has a magical candle another artifact from the Sunless Citadel that he has that emits a continuous flame spell. And I had to confirm. I'm like, please tell me you put that candle out before you went into this room. I, you didn't tell me about this room beforehand, but when you said Rotten Egg Smell, I remember that episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> no, that's exactly it. It was, a, it was a room that had a gas, a natural gas leak that was accumulating um, flammable gases. And it, it actually says in the book that if a character sparks a flame or you know sparks anything or is carrying a torch or any form that emits heat based light you know everyone in the room takes uh damage in some form yeah but it was uh that magical everlasting candle so yeah so luckily uh he he pointed that out to me and i'm like okay thank god yeah i, I had forgotten that as well but then he said it and i was like oh yeah and i wasn't going to tell him about it until they were in the room like i want like if that candle emits heat i want him to tell me that he's putting it out before he walks into the room so no harm there. They then uh, proceed through this room and they get to another hallway where there are another set of rooms on opposite sides of the hall. Uh, another room that had valuables in it that they could have looted but didn't bother because they didn't want to take a risk. And I can understand why they didn't want to take a risk because they were already so beat up from these previous fights that they didn't want to risk it. But if you ask me, they were playing too safe. Yeah, I feel like... Like, if the one problem that this group has is they're indecisive. They like they take too long to make decisions, and then they they they're not they don't want to take any risks. Uh, and it's like remember that episode of Rick and Morty where Morty's like, "Oh, this adventure is going off the rails," and then the Jelly Bean King's like, "Is that what adventures do?" Like, yeah, it happens. <laughs> like the confrontation. And the stuff happening that you have to overcome is the fun part of the game. Yeah. So if you avoid that the entire time, you're really missing not, out. You're not having fun. That's yeah. why that's why when we were playing the Sun the Citadel, Clarence Spellshell would just walk into rooms. Sure, he'd set off a trap sometimes. But it would be fine because stuff was happening. So yeah, and then uh, then the room next door to that had like six zombies, but they actually dealt with those zombies really well because they managed to bottle them up inside the door frame. Oh yeah. And Connor, his character with him leveling up, he got an evocation that gives his Eldritch Blasts force damage. So they could basically blast a character and whatever he hits uh, will be knocked back 10 feet. And because all of these zombies are trying to get out of the door at the same time, whenever the first zombie would get knocked with this, it would basically be knocked into all the other zombies. Yeah. So none of them could get out of the door clearly. So they did a really good job of knocking these zombies out one by one. Yeah, that was good. No, they did really well with the zombie. Oh, sorry, I'm a little... <sighs> they, uh, they then came yes. to uh, the next room at the end of this hallway, which I feel like I got the best reaction out of Maya stand for this one because it was a torture chamber. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and he didn't want to help one of the people because uh, of their race. Yeah, we, oh, he straight up denied help to someone because of the way they looked. He didn't want, there was like, there was an old human hanging up, correct? Yes, so in the, and, first off, let me read you the flavor text for this room. Uh, the walls and floor of this room are covered with streaks and splashes of dried blood. Two dangling bodies are shackled to the east and south wall. One is an elderly male human, the other a young female tiefling. And I explained to them that a tiefling is a devil folk. Not much context there for new players. Um, so maybe that's partially on me. Both are covered in bloody gashes, and neither is moving. In the middle of the room is a sturdy wooden chair with a bloody whip draped over it. 
A bucket of half bucket half filled with salt sits on the floor nearby. <laughs> and Maya Stan had like the Oh, oh my god. <laughs> like that's visceral. He actually said that. And uh, he says, I know a torture room when I see one. I'm like, why? Yeah, why? <laughs> um, so yeah, and uh, Maya Stan said that uh, I'm gonna go look at the mail because I don't trust the demon lady, and I'm like you do realize that not all tieflings are evil monsters, right? And I said, they're just like any other humanoid creature. They just happen to have devil features. He says, yeah, but you said demon lady. And I'm like, demon doesn't mean evil. It just means that she has horns and a tail. Yeah. You see, now fate. Fate is a borderline evil tiefling. I can't believe his character sheet says chaotic good. That's such <laughs> bull. I'm changing that you, as soon as Matt You have to change I'm changing that, that as soon as Matt lets me. I'm chaotic, neutral, chaotic, evil at best. My lord. So, anyways, um, eventually, uh, so they check on the old man. And I say, okay, roll a medicine check. And he says, all right, it's a 15. He's dead. Yeah. Like, there's nothing you can do for him. Tiefling woman's alive, though. Yeah, and as they said, the tiefling woman is alive, and they, uh, they wind up helping her, releasing her, and she tells him a bit of information that when she was captured and brought down here, she couldn't see anything because she was constantly had a bag over her head. But what she could hear is in the hallway just through the door opposite of where they just entered, that they she thought she could hear the sound of a stone door opening and closing, followed by wet footsteps. Um, and which, after releasing her and making sure she was okay, they let her go. Um, they open up the hallway and it's completely empty. And they said, well, she said she heard a stone door opening in this area, and uh, then splashing. So do you think maybe there's a hidden passage here somewhere? And this is where my, I said this, we wanted to say, you think, you think, you think? Because they rolled perception checks. We're like, okay, I want everyone to roll a perception check. And they're like, I, I rolled a 21. I rolled a dirty 20, 19. I'm like, okay, so you all are checking the walls and you all discover that there are some discrepancies in the wall. You notice yeah. that one particular section of the wall has no um, lacquer or mortar holding it to the other bricks. You can feel a draft coming through it, and you notice that there is a complete... I even did this. There is a section of the wall from the ceiling to the floor where it looks like something is out of place. You even called it a door once. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, hmm, what could it be? <laughs> And, God, uh, I love And then so there was much. like, does anybody see a lever to see how it opens? And I'm like, it's a door. <laughs> does, do, do I have to do something? It's, it's, a door. it's a door. And I didn't want to just say, push or pull on it. I wanted to say, push or pull, push or pull, push or pull. <laughs> and eventually, someone decided they were going to take, they, they, uh, my stand, my stand yeah. took one of his javelins. He says, I'm going to push on it. And I said, it opens. Because it's a door. <laughs> It's a heavy ass strong door, a stone door, but it's still a door. And they open it up. And then uh, basically this is what winds up happening. That what they should have what should have happened according to the book was they would either walk down or stealth down the hallway and there would be this large room at the end where there were two people fighting. One a very strong, very large brute with a great axe and a large amount of scarring on one side of his face. However, this particular brute is heavily wounded and looks like he's struggling to stand. Meanwhile, there's another person who is being, uh, who is currently on the ground, who is shirtless, who is wearing leather pants, and has all of the flesh from their head removed. This is the final uh, boss um, and the final leader of the Dead Three, the uh, Death Skull or the Death's Head of Ball. Okay, so. They, they got the... So, yeah. So we they, just took a potty break. Sorry if we're spaced. So, <laughs> basically, they wanted to sneak up on these two guys fighting. And they started off doing that. But Connor made a crit fail um, where... He gets so angry when he makes crit fails. And I it, love making crit fails. And he <laughs> basically, the way I punished him was that, one, they no longer had the element of surprise, but now the two people who were in the room were aware of their presence. So... Not only do you not have any stealth coverage, but everyone knows where you are. Um, now, they couldn't actually see them, so the one with the skull head says, you know, calls out, who's there? Show yourself. 
And then Maya Stan tried doing this really clever, or tried being really clever, where he says, I want to take the cult, the uh, the cloak from the dead three necromancer that I took earlier, put it on, and try and deceive him into thinking I'm one of their own. And I said, okay, roll a deception check. Um, he rolled fairly high, but then his cover was blown almost immediately after he tried having a conversation, because the guy with the scars, who was heavily wounded, doesn't like the dead three anymore. And I'll explain why in just a second. But the guy who has the red skull, uh, the, the flesh missing from his skull says, oh, thank God, back up, come help me, blah, blah, blah. And my stand just decides to charge in there without any recollection of who may or may not be a bad guy. He was here. like, you just got pranked, bro. <laughs> and he threw the cloak off and rushed in. And um, so he, he starts charging at the dude with the, with the scars and the mortal wounds. And he says, no, wait, I'm a member of the Vanthaper family. You don't want to attack me. Um, and he hesitates. And Maya Stan being Maya Stan immediately stops and says, who do you worship? <laughs> or, no, he says, who do you serve? And... Uh, the guy with the spatial scar says, I serve the Vanthaper family. I don't know what you want me to say. And the guy with the, uh, with the flesh missing from his skull says, what do you mean, who do I serve? You serve the same gods. And he's like, wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, that's where you're wrong, mister. <laughs> throws, his, throws his cowl off and he's like, I'm actually a good guy, even though I commit mass genocide to those who don't believe in the same religion as I do. <laughs> it sounds lawful stupid, but he doesn't play it lawful no, stupid. No, I, I, I joke with him a whole lot about his character, but he actually plays my stand really well. Anyway, so basically a five-on-one fight commences. Now, let me compare this boss to the one they just finished, which was the Necromancer. Like they it's, had, it's a stronger stat fight. Yes, the, the current boss, the as he's known as the Death's Head of Ball, is a challenge rating of 5, and the Necromancer was a challenge rating of 4. So you would think there'd be a higher challenge. However, they now have the full party, since Connor's here, and they have... An NPC. An NPC whose name is Mortlock Vanthapur, and we'll get into him after the fight. And so it's a 5v1. So what should have been like the penultimate boss fight for this party wound up being that scene from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 4 where the gang thinks they found a stand user and they start curb stomping him, but really it's just a, a normal guy. I think that's Part 5. I haven't gotten that far in Part 5. So basically it, they he gets one or two good hits off on him, but he doesn't knock anybody out, and they just curb stomp him. And he straight up had an ability where... He didn't take he could he didn't have to take damage if he didn't want to, and he could stun enemies for a single turn if they didn't roll a good enough saving throw. But he just couldn't land a hit for some reason. Yeah, well, he also had to deal with five people. Yeah. So he they basically win by a by a landslide, and they immediately start interrogating uh, Mortlock as they should. And basically, what he winds up telling them is, um, let me get to my notes here real quick. So he explains to them that, uh, look, 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 I know this is a really bad situation, but let me explain. Uh, I am, in fact, the uh, youngest, uh, yeah, youngest son of the Vanthaper family. Um, however, there's a reason why me and the other guy were fighting. It's because they were paid by my other siblings to kill me. And Maya stands like really hesitant. He's like, well, what were you doing down here in the first place? And he says, well, I was told by my family to run the dead three from the bottom of the bathhouse. He says, so you were the leader of these assholes. And he said, yeah, basically, but not anymore. He says, so give me a good reason why I shouldn't kill you. And he says, because my family has forsaken me. They were the ones who put the hit out on me to have me killed by the dead three. And I can help you bring them down. And they're like, well, why would we care about your family being brought down? And he says, let me tell you a little something. You know a guy by the name of uh, Raven Guard? And this is a guy that they heard of earlier. He was the Archduke for Baldur's Gate who had left the city um, when Eltruel fell. He went to go to Eltruel on a political mission, and when the city disappeared, he went with it. So the Archduke is no longer there. So the Vanthaper family, as it turns out, was the one who hired the Dead Three to cause chaos in the city and cause problems for the Flaming Fist, the mercenary group who the party is currently an honorary member of. 
By doing so, the Vandiper family would prove to the city that the Flaming Fist could no longer protect them and was utterly loose, useless. And with them out of the way, the matriarch of the Vanthaper family, the Duchess, would have an easier time becoming the new Grand Duke of, or Grand Duchess of Baldur's Gate. So there's this whole conspiracy where cult leaders are being hired to murder people in order for a po corrupt politician to gain power. And they say, wow, that's actually a lot to digest here, but that's still not a reason why we shouldn't kill you. And he explains to them that, you know, that because of his physical standing and the fact that he's not as smart or as good looking as his other brothers, his mother hates him. And so um, there's a reason she put him in the dungeon to run the dead three because he is a scourge on the family and they don't want anything to do with him. So as soon as he gets the chance, he's going to leave Baldur's Gate and never come back. Um, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like how Trump hates Eric, but loves Ivanka. Exactly. <laughs> um, so he says, uh, so Maya Santelli says, okay, here's the deal. I will let you live on two conditions. One, you forsake any connections to the dead three you may or may not have had. He says, I hate those guys anyway. Screw it. Done. And he says, okay, and two, with all of this coming to light with your family and your mother, you help us take them down. And he says, Yes and no. And they say, what do you mean yes and no? And he says, well, here's the thing. My mother and my brothers already think I'm dead. Like, they don't want me there. There's no way that I could be an asset to you getting into our estate. But what I can do is I happen to know where my other brother, whose name is Amrick, is located. I can get you to him. You can take advantage of him and use him as leverage against my mother. Once I do that, I'm out of the city and you'll never hear from me again. And you'll never see me working with the Dead Three ever again. And these terms are acceptable. Um, so they now have um, Mortlock as a temporary ally. He'll at least be with them until they get Amric. And he even rewards the party with tons and tons of treasure, which one was being used to pay off the dungeon or the, the dead three members, but has also stolen loot from Tiamat, <laughs> the Dragon Queen. Oh, I didn't know that part. You didn't? No, I th oh, you might have told me that a while ago, but I don't Yeah, remember. so here's you, the thing. You, you usually tell me what's coming like two weeks before, and then I forget half of it. So Mortlock explains to them, um, he says, there's no way in hell that you'll use me to get to my mother. Not, not because I don't want to help you take down my mother, but because my mother has security and help at her, at her manner that is otherworldly. And they just took that for face value, like, okay, maybe she's got, like, a god or deity blessing or something. And then he mentions that the treasure was stolen from Tiamat's horde, and Maestan, who worships Bahamut, is like, how did you get Tiamat's treasure? I might have been in the bathroom for that. And he said, well, remember when I told you that my mother had otherworldly uh, protection and security? And he said, yeah. Like, yeah, they're from hell. <laughs> They literally walked into Tiamat's treasure hoard, stole it, and brought it back to our realm. Mm. And she, he's like, oh, well, I don't like the fact that this treasure's been touched by Tiamat, but anything that makes her angry will make me happy. <laughs> and so everyone got a bunch of treasure. That um, was a lot of treasure. Yeah, everyone got like 3,000 copper pieces or 20 or 2,000 silver pieces. Uh, Keocat actually got this really cool porcelain dragon mask. Um, yeah. I think any of our other players would have sold it, but she's actually wearing it. And that's totally fine. I told her what its value was, so if she ever does want to sell it, but she is actually wearing a chromatic dragon porcelain mask, which is really cool. Um, and so they got their they got their treasure, they got their loot, they gained an ally, and so um, someone asked, you know, what would happen, you know, we haven't killed all the cultists. We heard that there were some people still around the dungeon. What's going to happen now? And he says, well, you made it this far. I'm assuming you've killed all the other leaders. With the leaders dead and no money coming into their pockets now, they're just going to scatter into the wind. You might catch a couple of dead three cultists wandering around Baldur's Gate doing their own thing, but as far as the dead three as an organization, they're dead. Nice. What they didn't realize was that there were a bunch of uh, statues and altars in one of the rooms they didn't explore that was of Ball, Bane, and Mercule that... Uh... Someone could still find him and resurrect shit. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, so they leave the dungeon, and this is where the session ends. They finally walk out into the bathhouse um, lawn, and as they walk out, five figures jump the fence and confront them. Not starting a fight, not doing anything, but these figures are wearing metallic dragon masks, and they have 
blades like daggers and swords that look like dragon claws. And that's where um, uh, Maya Stan proceeds to say, I thought I smelled heresy. <laughs> And then uh, that's also where the session ended. Everyone was ready to end. We were all tired. We were t four and a half hours. I was ready. Like, <laughs> if it wasn't so late, I'd take a nap. I think Geocat was... did take a nap. Didn't she say she was going to go do that? Yeah, I think she just like immediately took a nap after <laughs> after she left. I don't I'm blame her. Sure. Oh, yeah. It was it was good stuff. The like just. The whole group together got a, got fit through, finished with that. <sighs> it's nice to be out of the dungeon, you know? It is. And I'm so looking forward to the next session because there is definitely going to be more roleplay. I think the, the party enjoyed the roleplay at, like, the Elf Song Tavern and during some of the other parts of our campaign so far. But this dungeon... Thank goodness not all of the dungeons in the future are this long and this big of a slog. It wasn't even really that long. It really was. It just felt long. Ugh. It's not a lot in it to make it really interesting was the thing about this dungeon section of uh, Baldur's Gate to send into Avernus. Yeah. It just wasn't... You, eh. you, you were literally sent in, kill anything that's not you... And then report back. That was it. And I can understand that it was boring. I hope no one got a bad taste in their mouth afterwards. Um, I hope no one was discouraged. Because next session there will be lots of role play. There will be lots of opportunities to be charismatic. Uh, be intimidating. Be whatever you want to be. Um, with some combat sprinkled in. It will not be the main focus like it was this session. Is my secret NPC showing up next session? When does that happen? Yes, that is that is actually happening as soon as we deal with these dragon mask wearing figures. I figured as much. Um, in the next session. Nice. I'm ready. I've already prepped my dialogue and everything. <laughs> cool. I'm actually really excited because I've, uh, I've pretty much allowed... I, I've, you, you wanted to roleplay this guy for a while. And I've, I've given you what he is, where he's from, and how he's supposed to act, but I've let you fill in all the dialogue options. Yeah, I get to roleplay him for like a little bit now, and then not at all until they're like level 13. <laughs> and they just went up to level 4. Yeah, this is going to be one of those M-level secret boss encounters. If they fought him now, he would kill, kill all of them on his turn. Like, he's that strong. <laughs> <laughs> like, to give you an idea, he has a challenge rating of 19. Yeah. Our players only just made it to level four. Well, my stand technically made it to level five. Yeah, because right? he's he survived other stuff, so he's a level ahead. But uh, yeah, that's basically it for this session of Baldur's Gate: Descent into Avernus. The next um, episode will probably be over the Call of Cthulhu Seventh Edition starter set. I might do that one by myself since I'm the one that owns it. And then we're also going to have an episode of Rick and Morty Total Recall. Total Rick call. Card Hopefully, game. at some point, we will also be playing the. Uh, well, I don't want to say that because I don't want to date the episode, but we'll, we'll be playing some more new stuff and stuff that we haven't gotten around to yet. So stay tuned, stay interested. For the ladies out there, we got the My Little Pony Tales of Equestria TTRPG coming. You're going to make me play that. Why would I make you play anything? Because you don't have enough people to run it regularly. Yeah, I do. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Just because you're insecure, <laughs> it's just another fantasy TTRPG. You just play as horses. That's, <laughs> that's no big deal. I'm just not a big fan of ponies. Uh, yeah. Uh, Keocat's like a huge MLP fan. I wouldn't have bought it if she didn't want to play it so badly. But I'm actually kind of sick of Dungeons & Dragons, to be completely honest. I want to play a different system. Any different system. <laughs> like I'm, re I'm ready to go with something else, uh, which is why I'm basically just assisting you and not playing right now. That and because we're playing in another group, I'm already burned out. So actively playing into it would, I would not be focused. But yeah, that's basically it for this week's episode of Tabletop Recap. Uh, Hope you enjoyed it. We do have more coming weekly, Saturday mornings at uh, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Because that's just how we live our lives. But that's it. Thank you all once again for your support, and I'll see you all next time. Later.